This week's American Swimming Coaches Association talk comes from Hall of Fame coach Don Swartz. Coach Don Swartz discusses the concept of a quantum leap in performance and explores the three key ingredients necessary for achieving such a leap. Check out ASCA's upcoming events and clinics after the talk. And don't forget to mark your calendars for the World Clinic in Dallas this year, September 6th through 9th. Nonsense in the beginner's mind, looking for a quantum leap. By Don Swartz. Just imagine. It is midsummer in 1984. The temperature is 82 degrees, but the climate is expectant. July 29th is the day. It is 5.45 in the afternoon. We hear, gentlemen, 200 meters freestyle. The hushed silence roars in our ears. Take your mark. The horn sounds. The first 50 is turned in 25.8. The second 50 is a controlled 27.0. The timing board shows a 52.8. Next comes a sizzling 26.8, which puts him into the lead by three-tenths of a second. He strokes off the wall, commanding the world's attention as he amazes all but a few with the final 50 in 26.6. Out in 52.8 and back in 53.4 for a 145.2, a new Olympic and world record. Who will that swimmer be? Perhaps Rowdy Gaines, Bruce Hayes, David Larson, or Michael Cross. Or even Thomas Fahner or Dave Loudon. No matter his name, ladies and gentlemen, coaches, swimmers, and spectators alike, you have just witnessed a quantum leap, both in the scientific and colloquial sense of the phrase. Scientifically, a quantum leap is from a multifaceted potentiality to a single actuality. Eight swimmers and really thousands around the world represent the multifaceted potentiality, as does the time for the event from one one one-hundredth of a second to infinity. The name of that swimmer and his time are the single actuality. Colloquially, a quantum leap refers to an event which is out of the ordinary, something not anticipated, an occurrence quite special when measured against the norm. It is an event which batters down previously well-established limitations. The momentum and excitement generated by an Olympic year traditionally provide the dramatic backdrop necessary for such leaps in performance. Certainly Rob Beeman's 29 feet, 2 and 1 half inch long jump in Mexico City was a quantum leap, no pun intended. In 1981, Mary T. Maher swam 57.9 and 2059 for the butterfly. These swims definitely qualify as quantum leaps. Many of you have witnessed similar occurrences with your age groupers, big-time drops which seem to come out of the blue. In fact, many youngsters, because of their lack of experience, seem unaware of limitations. What factors combine to produce such performances? If you can identify some of the factors, perhaps you can better position yourself and your athletes to take advantage of the opportunities, the multifaceted potentialities, of this Olympic year. I see three key ingredients, foundation stones if you will, for building a platform for quantum leaps, for breaking the barriers of both sport-imposed and self-imposed limitations. These three are, nonsense, the beginner's mind and the dance within the game. For 17 years I have worked with athletes in search of quantum leaps, ten of these as a swimming coach and the last seven as a teacher of mental preparation. Three authors have greatly enhanced my awareness of what is involved in quantum leaping. The first is Gary Zukav, from whose book The Dancing Wu Li Masters, my title for today's talk is inspired. He clearly identifies two of the three foundation stones. The first is nonsense, the second is the beginner's mind, and these are inseparably entwined. To paraphrase Zukav, the importance of nonsense cannot be overstated. The more clearly we experience something as nonsense, the more clearly we are experiencing the boundaries of our own self-imposed reality. Nonsense is that which does not fit into the prearranged patterns that we have superimposed on reality. There is no such thing as nonsense apart from a judgmental intellect which calls it that. True coaches and athletes know that nonsense is only that which viewed from our present point is unimaginable. Stated another way, something is only nonsense because we haven't yet found a perspective from which it makes sense. Generally speaking, athletes and coaches do not deal in nonsense. Most spend their lives thinking and performing along well-established norms. Two workouts a day, six or seven days a week, over distance in the early season at slower than race pace specific distances at or near race pace in the mid-season, less than race distance, faster than race pace in the late season, aim for best unshaved times during the season, then shave for the one big meet. However, those who establish the well-established norms are the ones who continually venture boldly in nonsense, into that which any fool could have told them is clearly not so. Imagine the first shaved swimmer. This is the creative mind and in fact is the creative process. It is characterized by a steadfast confidence that there exists a point of view from which the nonsense is not nonsense at all, in fact from which it is obvious. In swimming, as elsewhere, those who most have felt the exhilaration of the creative process are those coaches and swimmers who best have slipped the bonds of the known to venture far into the unexplored territory which lies beyond the barrier of the obvious. This type of person has two characteristics. The first is a childlike ability to see the world as it is and not as it appears so according to what we know about it. This is the beginner's mind. 
You will recall the story told to you as a child about the Emperor's new suit of clothes. Only a child proclaimed the Emperor to be naked as he rode through the streets. The rest of the people forced themselves to see, because they had been told to see, his finest new clothing. The child in us is always naive, innocent in the simplistic sense. There is the Zen story about Nanin, the Japanese master who met a university professor. The professor wanted to learn about tea, so Nanin served him tea. He poured the professor's cup full and then kept on pouring. The professor watched the overflowing tea until he could no longer contain himself. It is overfull, no more will go in. Like this cup, said Nanin, you are full of your own opinions and speculation. How can I show you Zen unless you first empty your cup? Our cup is usually filled to the brim with the obvious, the common sense and the self-evident. Suzuki Roshi, who established the first Zen center in the United States, told his students, In the beginner's mind there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind there are few. The mind of the beginner is empty, free of the habits of the expert, ready to accept, to doubt, and open to all the possibilities. The second characteristic of true coaches and athletes is the firm confidence they have in themselves. This confidence is an expression of the inner strength which allows them to speak out, secure in the knowledge that it is the world that is confused and not they. The first coach to see an illusion by which others have flourished surely stands in a lonely place. In that moment of insight, he or she sees the obvious which to the rest of the world appears as nonsense. This confidence is not the obstinacy of the fool, but rather the surety of him who knows what he knows and knows also that he can convey it to others in a meaningful way. While it is the swimmer who makes the quantum leap, it is very often the coach who makes it possible, by seeing the obvious and then conveying it to the athlete. Let's for a moment look at one of the factors involved in swimming fast, conditioning or training. Certainly the obvious reason for training hard and diligently is to prepare the physiological systems to meet the challenges placed upon them during the competitive moment. Yet of more significance is the confidence the swimmer gains in those systems to withstand the stress he or she will place upon them in competition. This is one of the reasons for overload. If I can swim 10 times 200 flies in practice, certainly I can swim one in a meet, probably faster than any one of those I did in practice. If I can swim 10 times 100 breaststroke on the 130 and get down to a 115, I can expect to go faster than 115 in a meet. I have developed a certain confidence in my abilities. How much faster than 115 remains a mystery until I go to the meet. Perhaps I have a goal in mind, 112, 110. If I am Kim Rodenba, I may even consider 108 for 100 meters. That goal is merely a statement of my expectation, an expectation based upon my awareness of my capabilities, an awareness developed in large part through my training. So training is far more significant than just preparing the physiological systems. Training is a chance, a valuable opportunity, to venture boldly into nonsense. Coaches, empty your cups. Look at training with the beginner's mind. On June 26, 1982, I participated in the most significant event of my athletic career. At 5 in the morning along with 289 other runners, I began the Western States 100. This is a 100-mile endurance run on trails through the Sierra Nevada mountains. After 15 hours of running, walking, and a great deal of shuffling, through snow, mud, water, and heat, I finally succumbed at a checkpoint appropriately named Devil's Thumb. I had lost 13 pounds, had a blood pressure of 76 over 50, and could not physically get out of the chair into which I had collapsed for yet another change of shoes. I was greatly disappointed not to have finished and greatly elated to have participated. But I share this personal note with you for a special reason. Medical opinions notwithstanding, I had made quantum leap in my awareness of my limitations. Never before had I gone that far into the unknown, the nonsense. What I learned about myself was invaluable. I have since discarded many cherished limitations to which I previously clung. I have utilized many different training techniques and patterns with great success as a result of that one experience. I am truly addicted to nonsense. What would happen to your swimmer's perception of their limitations if you made some significant alterations in your training programs? Instead of going two hours in the morning and two hours at the evening, what about a schedule as follows? Monday, one hour in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. Tuesday, nothing in the morning and four hours in the evening. Wednesday, nothing in the morning and two hours in the evening. Thursday, one hour in the morning and four hours in the evening. Friday, off. Saturday, six hours. Sunday, off. Or how about one day a week set aside to go to exhaustion? Or, Monday to Thursday go two hours in the morning, one hour on weights and one hour swimming in the evening. On Friday go four hours and Saturday go eight hours. Or occasionally throw this into the schedule, Friday, three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon. Saturday three hours in the morning and four hours in the afternoon. Sunday four hours in the morning and five hours in the afternoon. Monday two hours in the morning then off until Friday. If you are sitting there right now rejecting these ideas on the spot, for whatever reason, because they are nonsense, I feel disappointed. Disappointed because as coaches you have an opportunity to be unique. 
You are bound by no corporate guidelines. Your imagination is your only limitation. In his superb book about limitations, entitled Illusions, Richard Bach states, You are never given a wish without also being given the power to make it true. You may have to work for it, however. If you fail to stretch your imagination, the ones who suffer with you are your athletes. But Don, I have only sprinters. What am I going to do with four hours? I can hardly keep them wet for two hours. My response is to rethink your thinking. Perhaps you have a hard time because they have a hard time. Suppose for a moment your sprinter has a best time of 46.3 for the 100-yard freestyle. What if on Saturday he came in and you gave him a workout of 20x100 all to be done at 48.5 or better? He might be there for a while. He might also learn a tremendous lesson. The more fatigued I get, the more precise I must be in every move I make. But Don, I have only two hours each afternoon and no morning water time. Your ideas may be great for others with unlimited pool time, but not for me. Rethink your thinking. To increase the intensity of effort by your swimmers and thereby increase their awareness and levels of expectation, try this as a suggestion. Everyone works out Monday, Tuesday, and Friday as usual. On Wednesdays, half around comes into train while the other half observes, times, or helps the coach. On Thursday, you switch the groups. With only half the number of swimmers in the pool, you can probably more than double intensity. You can push further into the unknown, into the nonsense. These ideas on training are merely a starting point. As swimming coaches, you are among the most creative people in the world. In fact, you would not have chosen this profession if you didn't have a fair measure of nonsense to begin with. So, empty your cup, rethink, and venture boldly. Again quoting from Richard Bach, the original sin is to limit the is. Don't. At Clovis last month I heard several coaches remark that stroke technique seems to have been sacrificed and in some cases replaced completely with yardage. None of you would dispute the necessity of having efficient, technically proficient stroke technique, starts, turns, and finishes. What if one day each week you devoted the entire workout session to stroke? Run a regular workout but make stroke proficiency, not repeat times the only concern. Get a video camera and film the entire workout. Some amazing results are guaranteed. What about meets? What if you held a dual or tri-meet for your sprinters and stroke specialists along the following lines? Offer a 50, 100, and 200 of each stroke, plus a 100, 200, and 400 individual medley. Each swimmer picks his or her best stroke, or I am, and swims only that stroke, but at every distance. Run through the entire list of events three, four, or five times. Give awards based upon the best average time or least total accumulated time. This format would encourage repeated concentration, discourage excuses such as, but coach, this is my off event. Promote intensity of effort and consistency and give the swimmer a chance to learn from his mistakes immediately. This would also give the coach an opportunity to formulate some specific goals for next week's training sessions. To sum up, in the beginner's mind there are many possibilities, in the experts there are few. For your swimmers to make a quantum leap, you as coach must venture boldly into the nonsense. Since we are talking about meets, I would like to set in place the third foundation stone of the quantum leap. This comes from noted teacher, athlete, and author, George Leonard. In his stimulating book, The Ultimate Athlete, Leonard writes of the dance within the game. Those of you who have competed or are still competing may have had an experience commonly referred to as a peak performance. One of the singularly significant characteristics of such a performance is the rhythmic quality of that happening. At the core of our very existence is a cycle of motion, a perfect rhythm. When we are tuned into that rhythm, effortlessness results, while the results of our efforts themselves are often profound. Usually you are very nearly extended physically, but the effort is perceived as minimal. The dance within the game is pure joy of movement, a melting of the body's harmonies into one beautiful rhythm. As a runner, I have had these moments, and as a skier, they happen rather frequently. I am aware of this phenomenon and constantly leave myself open to its occurrence. My experience is that you cannot force it to happen. Yet by being aware of its existence and letting it happen by simply dancing to the rhythm, your athletes can more easily and more often enjoy it. As a coach, you can witness this perfect rhythm in your workouts. As coach, you are the conductor, the athletes are the orchestra, and the workout is your symphony. I can distinctly recall the feeling as a coach of orchestrating a perfect workout. I was extended to the maximum of my capabilities, and when one was finished I was exhilarated, not exhausted. Perhaps you too have had such an experience. The workout tonight was great. Everything and everyone seemed together as one, it just simply clicked. Sadly, we in the Western world are so wrapped up in getting results. We are all too occupied with getting to the victory stand. This preoccupation keeps us from dancing, from being centered in the moment. Being centered, focused, put more simply, just being, is crucial to the quantum leap. The ceremony, ritual, and mystique encompassed by the five Olympic rings can serve to heighten the dance, which can yield some amazing swims. And you need not be competing at the Olympics to dance. Our sport of swimming thrives, indeed, it seems to draw its very life's breath from this quadrennial happening. 
From the age grouper to the gold medalist, the Olympic Games touches each of your programs. They provide a well-lighted floor with Dolby sound on which every swimmer from novice to master can dance. But will they? A lot depends on you, the coach. I ask you to make them aware of the dance and give them the chance. I share with you the following, taken from George Leonard's 14th chapter. He discusses an article by Clayton Riley which appeared in the March 1974 issue of Miss Magazine. The article is entitled, Did O.J. Dance? In the article, Riley notes that the superb beauty and control of football's greatest running back, O.J. Simpson, has been largely lost on white fans because O.J. never played on a winning professional team. Riley quotes a black friend, White boys want only to know what the final score was. They are interested only in the results. Brothers want to know what happened in the game. Did O.J. dance? Riley goes on to draw a sharp line between the way white and black males experience life. The whites, in their single-minded pursuit of victory, dehumanize their opponents and themselves and eventually lose touch with existence itself. The blacks, deprived of the corrupting effects of power focus on style, the very essence of life. There is truth in what Riley says. White Western culture, at its worst and most extreme, can be characterized with one simple phrase, it is anti-dance. The dance aspects of our religious rites have been relentlessly rooted out. Sacrament and movement have been split apart. We walk to get somewhere. We run to get in shape or to set records. We do everything because of something else. Dance is an activity performed on stage. Blacks, on the other hand, have somehow managed to remain aware of the dance that lies at the heart of every movement. By their very way of walking, they are likely to signal the fact that they are tuned into the rhythmic, pulsing, dancing nature of existence. Leonard says, Riley is right, but I believe he draws too sharp a line. There is a desire in all of us, no matter how veiled, however, corrupted by the lust for victory, to see O.J. dance. Out of a lifetime of sports spectating the moments that lie for us, whatever our race, our pure dance. To dance, O.J. needs worthy teammates and effective coaches. He also needs worthy opponents. It is in fact their full commitment to stop him that forces his dance to a higher level. He needs a physical and psychological context for this dance. Thus the stadium, the business organization the public relations and ticket sales effort, the fans, and finally the collusion of all involved to make each game and each season into something dramatic and significant. In this context, we can read Coach Lombardi's Winning isn't everything, it is the only thing, not as a statement of fact, but as part of the collusion to create a supercharged atmosphere. It would be more accurate to say that winning isn't everything, it is one element in the dance. The Olympic Games themselves and all that surround them certainly provide just such a supercharged atmosphere. I hope, indeed I plead with you to use it. The gift of the dance you as a coach give to your athlete will last a lifetime. And so, once again, those three pillars of the starting block for quantum leaps are nonsense, the beginner's mind, and the dance within the game. In closing, I would like to share with you a message that's on my wall at home. Put very simply, it says, there are some times in life when you can't afford to think small. Each of you is personally charged with the responsibility to make your program stimulating, challenging, and wholesome. I add to that the fervent desire to make yourselves and your athletes limitless. Hopefully, these ideas will be of assistance. If you choose to recognize them, know that you are really applauding George French, who gave me a strong foundation in coaching. Rick Demont, who to this day, dances whenever he hits the water. And Dolores, my bride of nearly three years, who continually encourages my nonsense. We've got upcoming coaches clinics at Fishers High School in Fishers, Indiana. That's April 14th and 15th. And the Four Corners Coaches Clinic is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, April 21st through 23rd. Go to swimmingcoach.org to sign up.